What is up guys, it's your friend, the Lazy Life Guide. I do apologize, it's been quite some time since I've last uploaded to YouTube. Work has been getting really intense and making videos to upload to YouTube takes a very long time, especially with the use of all the software like Adobe Creative Cloud or the other things that we need to do in order to upload a video. So I do apologize for that on my part. So instead of letting things die down by not posting for such a long time, I thought I'd do a very brief, simple video in the interim while things are still busy. I promise that when my schedule gets better, I'll definitely upload a more comprehensive and proper video for you guys to watch. Today I want to talk about a very interesting topic, one that quite a number of people have been asking me over the past few months, and that is, should I go to law school? I think that this question is very important, especially as we move forward towards a new normal after COVID-19, the coronavirus that has completely ravaged our economy as of 2020. A lot of these considerations applied before COVID-19, but I think that after COVID-19, these factors will become even more relevant and even more strong. So you should consider them before committing four or five or even six years of your life to law school. So instead of just hearing from the people that the law schools are going to present to you as part of their open house, you know, because those people are obviously going to be slightly biased towards going towards law school, whether consciously or subconsciously, I thought that I give my candid opinion as to whether or not you should consider law school and what are some of the factors that you should consider and you must know. So I think the first thing that uh, comes to mind, of course, when people mention law school is it's going to be very difficult. And that is true, actually. Um, I'm not going to deny that law school is incredibly difficult, um, but not for the reasons that you think it is. Now, a lot of people think that law school is difficult because there's a lot of things to read. And that is partially true. Indeed, if you are in a common law jurisdiction, for example, like uh, where I'm from, uh, in NUS, uh, we do have a lot of cases that we do need to read. Uh, common law is a system whereby judges make law, and if judges make law, uh, they will often write out their judgments in a, a sometimes a, a little bit long of a passage, uh, and that requires a little bit of work uh, to get through. So that is definitely that, reading. But it's not really about the length of the judgment per se that's difficult. But rather, the most difficult part is actually understanding what the judge means. Because a lot of the time, judges don't always write in the most succinct manner possible. And when this occurs, sometimes the sentence can be really difficult to understand. So you need to spend a lot of time to read the sentence slowly to see what does it actually mean. And the worst part is, that even if you do manage to understand what one sentence in one paragraph means, you need to be able to connect that sentence to the other paragraphs that the judgment has. And that is another layer of difficulty because often at times the judge doesn't just give a straight up answer yes because there is no yes or no in law. Quite a number of times there will be a degree or a variation or a gradation of answers in which case, it's very difficult to just say yes or no. Often the answer lies somewhere in between. But law is dichotomous in the sense that there can only be one winner or one loser in the courtroom. You can't have both parties winning or both parties losing. That does not happen in litigation. Maybe mediation, maybe arbitration, but not litigation. So when you are forced to give a unilateral position to say you win or you lose, it's very difficult for the judge to do because often at times there will be merits on both sides of the case. And this makes it difficult for the reader, like you and me, you see, because when we read the judge's judgment, we are trying to understand how the judge reaches his decision, you see. And to do that, he's got to balance between both sides of the case, between yes, between no. And that's where the difficulty comes in, you see, because the sentences that the judges write are often nuanced. They express different views, different perspectives of both sides of the story, and that's where difficulty arises. Not about the length of the judgment, but about understanding what each sentence says, how each sentence connects 
to the case theory and how each case theory connects to each party's position. So that's the first difficulty. Not the length or the amount of reading per se, but rather the difficulty lies in trying to read and trying to understand what the judge really means. So before you enter law school, ask yourself this question. Am I willing to sit down and read the judgment to really understand what someone is trying to say? Am I someone who likes to appreciate nuances in language, nuances in sentences? Do these excite you? If they do, then law school would definitely be a good choice for you. Personally for me, I enjoy looking through documents. I like language. English is something that fascinates me. I love linguistics. I love looking at passages and I like dissecting meaning to try and find patterns, to try and find connections in text. So these kind of things excite me and therefore it pushes me towards taking law. So if these things excite you, then hey, law may be for you. Alright, so that's the first thing. The second thing that I think you should consider is the tough job market out there. Okay, of course, this statement doesn't apply to all jurisdictions and nor do I proclaim to know the job market in every single jurisdiction. But I can speak for Singapore because I did study in NUS, the National University of Singapore. And because of that, I'm a little bit acquainted with the job market here and I can give my two cents worth. When I mean that the job market is tough, what do I mean by that? First, it means that there is an oversaturation of lawyers. There are just too many law graduates competing for too little jobs. And because of that, you have employers putting a very heavy emphasis on grades in law school. And that is something that does not happen very often in other faculties. Not all faculties adopt the same system, but some. What you have is employers taking a more holistic approach. Employers don't just look at your grades or your GPA or how well you perform in your exams, but rather they look at things like work experience. They look at things like how many competitions you have entered, how many projects you have done. These kind of things supplement your grade and in fact, they supersede your grade. So even if you did poorly on an exam, but you have done many projects, you have many work experiences, you have done many internships, attachments, placements, these can very well make up for a poor grade and get you that job that you want. But that's not the case for law. Law is still mostly grade-centric. I've spoke to many people in HR, Human Resources for Law, uh, over lunch, and they very candidly tell you, you know, we don't bother looking at your extracurricular activities, we don't bother looking at all your work placements or everything. We look primarily at your grades. Some of the more liberal law firms, of course, are trying to shift away from this approach, so they are willing to consider a bit more of this, but the primary consideration remains as grades. So, if you are not the academic type of person, then you may be in for a tough ride because I must warn you that, at least in NUS, law is something that has a 10 percent of AAAA for A-levels. This means that at least 90% of people who entered law school had scored AAAA and above for A-levels. <laughs> this means that literally everyone here is a straight A student. So when you put everyone who is a straight A student onto yet another bell curve, obviously you're going to end up with a bell curve that is skewed very much towards the right-hand side. I remembered when I finished my taught law examination um, and, and I did very poorly for the exam. Um, it was my very first exam paper and I was quite disappointed at the results that I got. So I went to speak to my professor to ask, uh, Professor, what went wrong? Uh, how can I improve? I know this is my first exam and I don't want to make the same mistakes going forward in my law school. And the professor said something that really uh, uh, struck me. Uh, she said, um, you know, actually, your script is good, but your peer scripts are better. So what this means is that there is very fierce competition in law school, at least when it comes to the academic side. So that's the second reason. If you feel that you are a very academically inclined person, you are kind of person that performs well in exams, and you feel confident that you are able to get a good grade in the exam, 
then I strongly advise you to come to law school. So the second factor is this, will I be able to perform well if I was placed in a highly academically challenging environment and arena? The third consideration then is with regards to the other things like extracurricular internships and competitions like moots, for example. A moot is a legal debate, by the way. The problem arises because, as I mentioned, law firms look very heavily at grades, but there is a general shift towards a more holistic approach towards examining an entire candidate. This actually leads us to quite an awkward position whereby grades are still paramount, but firms are also looking at other extracurricular activities, competitions, internships that you are doing. It is especially so in 2020, which is the year that this recording is being made. As you know, the coronavirus, COVID-19, has ravaged the world, making it even more difficult for fresh graduates to find new jobs in such a competitive and difficult marketplace. Do you see the difficulty that arises here? So a candidate not only has to do well academically, but also has to be willing to go beyond academics to participate in other activities. And it can involve a very fine balancing exercise. Quite a number of my schoolmates, for example, are split into four camps. You have the first camp of people who decides, you know, I'm going to do well academically and I'm going to do well holistically as well. So what they do is that during the school term, of course, they focus on their schoolwork and they do all their assignments and tutorials, which are very intense, by the way. And then they dedicate time away from this to participate in competitions, moots, legal debates, extra work attachments, for example. The advantage of this position is pretty clear. Of course, you can get the best of both worlds. You're good academically, you're also good holistically. So whichever law firms you approach, whether it's a more traditional one that looks at your grades, or it's a more modern one that looks at your holistic performance, or even if you're applying in times like these, where the job market is so tough, you will likely be the candidate that will be right on top of everyone else because you have both grades and extracurricular activities. The downside of this position, however, is that it's often difficult to have your cake and eat it as well. A lot of the people I know who are in this category often do poorly in their grades. Of course, we have several notable exceptions where you have deans listers who are able to secure a 5-point GPA and still do all these things, but those are generally the exception. Uh, the more common scenario is that you have individuals who do average or below average for their grades and they do average or below average for their extracurricular activities. And remember, because I said that firms put grades first, these people with average or below average grades often don't make the cut. So a number of my friends in this position right now can't find jobs because their grades are average and their performance extracurriculars only average. So that's the first category of people. The second category of people are those who do well in extracurricular activities only. So what this means is that they have decided that I'm going to give up on my grades. I don't really care about those anymore. And I'm going to focus on other extracurriculars like internships, like moods, etc. So what these people are doing is that they are trying to be more market oriented. They're trying to be more job centric in their approach. They're trying to hope that by making as many connections, as many friends, as much work experiences as I can during the academic year, then I can directly reach out to the partners uh, in those firms and ask them to hire me. This is a smart move because the logic goes, if let's say you know the partner or you know the boss personally, it's easier for the boss to close one eye with regards to your grades because you know the boss knows your work, your good work in the firm and the boss is able to accept you for who you are regardless of your grades. The people I know who did this have extremely poor grades, very, very poor grades. So you have people with GPA of 2 point something over 5, which, by the way, in NUS is considered a very, very bad grade. Or you have people with GPA in their low 3s, which is below average. 
but they have stellar extracurriculars. They participate in many, many moods, many, many debates, etc., etc. Unfortunately, the key disadvantage with this position is that the person whom you work for may not be the person that may hire you. Ah, here we have a very unfortunate situation whereby perhaps the boss that you work for is not the person who hires you. This problem is especially compounded in big firms because you may be reporting to a lawyer who can see your worth, can see that you're actually a very good person. But that lawyer is not the person in HR and HR may not know your good works. Or you can have a situation whereby you work for the lawyer, but it is the partner that makes the hiring decision. So unless that partner clearly communicates to the hiring person of your good works, it may be very difficult for you to make it past the first cut of HR because HR looks at your grades. Even if, even if this decision is communicated across to HR or to the person making the hiring decision or if the person you work for is indeed the person that hires you, there is always the risk that the firm may not be hiring anymore. So I have friends who work for a particular firm, the firm really likes their performance, but unfortunately, the firm is not hiring people. So, when they go to another firm, the other firm doesn't know their performance, and all they can rely on is their grades. Which is quite sad, because the people I know in this category often do the worst. They are unable to find any traineeships, they are unable to get jobs as lawyers, and it can be really tough for them. The third category of students are those people who decide that they are going to do well academically only. That means, you know what, I'm not going to care about doing extracurricular activities. My main focus is only going to be doing well for exams. So they would channel a lot of their energy and time into studying, studying, studying every day, going to the library, going to the study room every day, just pouring over the materials. When the holiday comes, they decide, you know, I'm going to study ahead for the next semester. I'm going to do even more academic research to brush up other areas of the law. I'm not going to do any internships, not going to do any work placements. I'm just going to focus solely on studying. The advantage of this method is clear. Of course, as mentioned, most law firms still look at grades, at least for now. And because of that, if you are grade oriented, you are geared towards those law firms. So, if you do well and the law firm recognizes that, then you're pretty much set. And in fact, that's quite a popular option that most students take. So they will dedicate a lot of their time to doing well academically only in hopes that the law firm will recognize them. Unfortunately, again, the problem with this method is as follows. How are you so sure that you're going to do well for the exams? As mentioned, Everyone who comes to law school, at least in NUS, has stellar academic records, AAAAs for A-level at the 10th percentile. The exams are also graded on the bell curve, which means that it doesn't just matter how well you do, but how well your peers do and how well you do relative to your peers. And above all, I must remind you that law is really subjective in the sense that it's not like a science whereby there is an exact answer but rather it's more like an art whereby the professor has some discretion to see whether or not he likes your work or whether or not he doesn't like your work. I do like to think that most, if not all, professors are extremely unbiased in how they mark, they are impartial, they are fair, but it can be hard sometimes to ensure a uniform basis for marking. For example, I submitted work once to a particular professor and he really really didn't like it he was like this is uh, terrible it lacks analysis it's very bad etc etc but interestingly the next semester i took a very similar module and i wrote nothing different from the previous semester and i got an a plus for that module and i don't think it should come as any surprise honestly because this happens in real life too i mean you can be a lawyer that is presenting before a lower court your position and the judge is totally in agreement with you 
And then the other side decides to appeal and it goes up to a higher court and the higher court says, you know what, I completely disagree with the lower court's view. I overturn it. I think it's bad law. I don't think it should be followed. Sometimes the judge is even nastier. He goes on to say stuff like, I wonder what lousy law school that judge came from, only to realize that they are actually from the same school. <laughs> you know, st- stuff like that happens. So it's not uncommon for students to face similar problems too. But the problem arises is that if you put all your eggs into one basket, which is the basket of academics, and the professor doesn't like it, then you're pretty much done for. The final category of students are those people who decide, you know what, I'm not going to care about either grades or academics. I'm just going to focus on having a good time. I'm just going to focus on learning whatever I can learn. And after I finish my law degree, I'm going to jump over to another industry to work there. You'll be surprised that there are actually quite a number of friends I know who took up this position. They have seemingly lost the will and the desire to work hard for exams. They are not doing any internships or any other work attachments or placements. They are just focused only on learning, enjoying themselves, hanging out with friends because they are convinced that after I graduate from law school, I'm going to do something else entirely. So none of this matters, right? Because I'm not going to any law firm. Of course, the advantage with this position is that it really harkens back to the real, original, arguably the truest form of education, which is that of learning. Not about exams, not about work attachments, but about the joy of learning the law. The joy of being inquisitive, the joy of learning a discipline, that could be transferable to other industries. And indeed, law is traditionally regarded as a degree that is supposed to be versatile, supposed to be transferable, is supposed to be able to transcend across different boundaries of industries. So when I was applying for university, I was often told that if you don't know what you want to do in life, law will be a great option because law prepares you for many different industries. Or does it? I attended a career fair last year and I was walking through the convention halls, speaking to HR managers, speaking to hiring staff, and I asked them what positions they had open. The first question that almost all of them asked is, what faculty are you from? So I'll say, oh, I'm from the law faculty. And a lot of the times, their, their jaw will just drop. You know? I'm like, why me? Why? Of all the days, I have to talk to a lawyer. Why? I, I feel their pain. I, I have to talk to uh, law students every day too. You know? uh, but surprisingly, the conversation just ends there. I was expecting the staff to offer me positions that are available. It doesn't have to be specialized roles. It can be uh, roles or positions in any generic kind of jobs, like for example, human resources. But a lot of the times they just said, we don't have jobs for law graduates. And I was shocked. You would think that this would be different for different uh, industries, different companies, but I walked to every single convention hall and I spoke to dozens of people. All of them said the same thing. Sorry, we don't higher law graduates, you should be looking for a job in the law industry. And then it struck me, I understood why these people didn't want law graduates. And that is because in the jurisdiction I'm from, at least, law students have this negative stereotype that they are very argumentative, they are very aggressive, they are people who don't work well with other people. And there is some truth to this stereotype. I mean, of course, lawyers are indeed paid to argue in court. That is their job. We we don't call it argue, of course, we call it advocate. But in reality, it's really an argument. So you have this situation whereby law is supposed to be a very versatile degree. But when you go into the marketplace itself, you realize that that's not really the case. Employers don't want law graduates. So these people who chose this track, they are stuck as well because they also cannot find jobs, even with their law degree. So in sum, 
I think uh, that this current state of the industry that we are in right now means that there is no easy answer to any of these four positions that you take. If you decide to focus entirely on your grades or entirely on your CCAs or do both or do none, you may find yourself in a position being unable to find a job. And I think this should be a very powerful factor for your consideration. If you are someone who already knows where I want to be in future after I graduate from law school and already have a concrete plan on how to get there, for example, before entering law school, you already have connections with some other person in another industry who knows you, or for example, you have connections to someone in the law firm who recognizes you and is willing to put in a good word for you after you graduate, then I think you should consider law school. But for someone like me, I didn't have any connections. I'm the first lawyer in my family. And because of that, I don't have these privileges that quite a number of my schoolmates have. And that is having their father's friend, for example, being a huge partner in a huge firm. And because of that, they are able to identify their son or their daughter up for hiring. So if you do have these advantages, uh, I'd say go for it. You know, Don't throw it away and don't have to feel bad about exercising it. But I guess this message is for the people who don't have these advantages. Are you willing to work extra hard? to make up for this ground? Are you willing to roll the dice with a bell curve? Are you willing to risk getting rejected by the marketplace or having poor grades? If you are, if you are the kind of risk taker, if you are the kind of person who loves this kind of adventure, or if you are someone who really doesn't care about employment after they graduate, then I think law school is for you. Because indeed, the law is very interesting and I think it's very invigorating. It's something that really deserves and merits further study as his own discipline. But in today's current economic climate, it may be difficult to bank on your law degree to get a job. So that's it, guys. This is my little podcast of ideas in regards to the current law industry and my thoughts on it. Uh, Once again, I do apologize for the late upload and I hope that I'll be able to do this more often. But in the meantime, uh, I think I'll be settling for these kind of podcasts because they're a little bit easier to make on my part, a little less editing required. And I hope that you found this useful. Feel free to leave any questions in the comments below and I'll try to answer them as soon as I can. Till next time, my friends, I rest my case.